What's good kings and queens? I hope everyone's month is starting off right. Sorry for the delay, I had some contractual duties to fulfill. This week's video is on the best HBO debuts in boxing. So boxing prospects, contenders, former champs that you've been waiting to see on the HBO platform. Making your debut on HBO was a big thing, and fighters would do their absolute best to put on a show, and really make a statement. Now the fights I'll be showing are fights that are on the HBO broadcast, so there may be a fight or two that will be broadcasted by the promotion using HBO cameras. I will not be using those fights. It has to be on their headline. With that being said, let's start the video. Back when you had to come to America early to prove you were good in the heavyweight division. This was Lennox Lewis's 18th pro bout and second time fighting in America against former contender Tyrell Biggs, who just came off an 8 round TKO loss to contender Riddick Bowe. Now coming into the fight, the question was, is this too much of a step up for Lewis? Has Lewis fully transitioned from amateurs to, to the pros? You know, just silly questions you wouldn't hear coming into a fight if Lewis was an American. Uh, we'll see tonight whether he's advancing the same way, for example, a Riddick Bow has advanced. And the record for Lennox Lewis, 17 wins, no losses against an almost ludicrously weak list of opponents. 15 of the wins by knockout. But anyways, Lewis puts on a good show to the American critics that he is ready for a step up, completely outclassing Biggs in three rounds. And there's another right hand, and that might be knockdowns are on the right cross. Lewis throws another one, Biggs goes down again, and the referee's seen enough. Though he was credited for an impressive performance, they still found a way to put him down. Like I said, if Lewis was American, you wouldn't be hearing this for one, and two, he would have received much more praise for his great career. And I'll, I'll go in the ring and find out where he's going from here. Okay, let's do that, Larry. <laughs> See if he's gonna pick his next opponent by committee, or who's gonna pick the opponent. Well, you're right. He told us before that he was very enthusiastic about going ahead with top flight opponents, but that his business managers had to temper him. My interpretation of that was he wants to fight bums and they don't want him to fight anybody that good. <laughs> So early in Golovkin's career, even though he picked up a title belt, fighting in Europe was really holding him back because he wasn't making any noise, and all the promotional energy was being pushed on Dmitry Pirog. The holdback could possibly have been because of his nationality, but it was clear that Germany was not the place for him to grow into a star. New trainer and new promoter, K2 Promotions, a promotion that has a healthy relationship with HBO, a trainer as well can have a promotion pool getting a fighter into a network for what I'll say in this case an audition. Abel Sanchez who is a respectable figure in the sport not well known by the general public. Nine times out of ten if your training camp is in Big Bear California you're more than likely going to be using Abel's gym and that is where Oscar De La Hoya did a lot of his training camps over the years. So you had two influential figures in Golovkin's camp. Tom Loeffler at K2 Promotions and Abel Sanchez. Since Gennady had a title a HBO rolled the dice and he had his own event on Boxing After Dark. Like I said, this was an audition and this man aced it from round one and on. If you decided to tune in that day, which most in 2012 was like, who is this guy? You were in for a treat. I was one of the lucky people to tune in to watch this. I was blown away. You couldn't ask for any better of a debut. And he's still giving us all he has. Oh, right hand hurt Proxa. Golovkin steps in and down he goes again. <laughs> no, no, no. The referee stops it. Guys, Proxa. Yeah, Thurman once fought on HBO. Can you believe that? I was lucky enough to tune in for this fight as well. Now, he was originally supposed to fight Marcos Maidana, and Maidana dropped out of the fight for whatever reason. Thurman's replacement opponent was an incredibly tough dude that potentially can make his debut a not so pleasing one. But from the opening bell, this was exciting as hell. And there was a good left hook, and Laura wants to fight back and say, I'm just as good. He's getting ripped. against a guy like Thurman. After landing big shot after big shot, it looked like Thurman may not get what he promised during the HBO meeting because this guy was not budging. Not stopping Laura from coming after Three. Thurman. Between Keith Thurman and Orlando, Laura, Laura, staggered by a left 
Thurman in the sixth round finally gets him with the perfect shot to finish Laura off right there. Up to get him with. And tonight, that's what Laura's gonna look like when he goes. He made that clear, walking to his corner and talking to his trainer while listening to the count. He was done. So besides the amazing finish, 10 out of 10 style points right there, the post-fight interview was just as great. The nickname's one time, I'm looking for that knockout all the time, and I'm not in a rush to really do it. Um, if, I, if, you don't got, if you got a weak chin, we'll put you out early. Actually, I kind of was because of how tough he was. I thought I was going to have to do it one more time, and we were prepared to do it. But One more time, Keith, one more time, Thurman. Hey. It's Keith's one time Thurman, as you see. We're ready to make a uh, replays happen over and over again. Thurman's performance was great, but that interview sold me. I wanted to see more of Thurman. HBO signed this man. I'm looking for anybody. I'm young, I'm hungry. I'm the new thing in the Walter Wade division. We had to sit out for a year so y'all didn't get to hear me, but you see the thunder that I'm bringing into the ring. I'm ready for a belt. Paul Milinaji, I want your belt. Timothy Bradley, I want your belt. Floyd Mayweather, you're undefeated. I think I can defeat you. So we want we want everybody in the Walter Wade division, baby. We want everybody in the Walter Wade division. They call you a world champion. Come get some of Keith one time Thurman. Roman Gonzalez finally got the West's attention after his Fight of the Year nominee performance against WBC, Ring, and Lineal Champion Akira Yaigashi to become a three division champion to go 40-0. Roman Gonzalez is a Taken Promotions fighter, which is a Japanese promotion. Tom Loeffler at K2 Promotions formed a partnership with Gonzalez and Taken to promote him in the States. Thanks to that, Gonzalez received a HBO deal. Roman's debut will be the co-main event to Golovkin's fight with Willie Moreau. If you know your history, most of the time it's not good to repeat it. In this case, it's a good thing. When Mexican boxing legend Ricardo Lopez was fighting in the States, he was introduced to stateside fight fans on Julio Cesar Chavez's undercard. Unfortunately then, fight fans didn't appreciate the strawweight division. Definitely the problem was they didn't promote the weight classes nor the fighters like they should. K2 and HBO did a fine job promoting his debut and the lead up and all Roman had to do was put on a great show. His opponent was top three ranked Edgar Sosa. Sosa a year prior to his fight lost a 12 round decision against Akira Yaigashi. Though Yaigashi won quite convincingly, he was unable to do any damage to Sosa. So stylistically, this may be a tough fight for Gonzalez. Roman blew through this man in two rounds in the most exciting fashion. If you are a follower of the lower weight classes, this is a performance one can truly appreciate here. Not only this was an amazing debut, this was a huge win for the promotion of the lower weight classes that these divisions are marketable and the fighters are exciting. Anyone care that they're flyweight? some heavyweight action right 100%. there. 100%. Any questions, American boxing audience? Wow. More like a demand. And just a year later, Gonzalez was a main headliner in front of a sold out crowd. So this was one of the earliest fights on HBO, though HBO's claim to fame four years prior, becoming the first TV network to do a live satellite broadcast to show all of America Muhammad Ali versus Joe Frazier, the thriller Manila. The Bonds fight was part of a three fight program to generate hype, demand, and the fight purse Leonard was eyeing for a potential fight with Thomas Hearns or Marvin Hagler. So why is he fighting Larry Bonds? And who is Larry Bonds? For Leonard, this is the first part of a three-fight strategy. The next fight scheduled for June is supposed to be against Ayub Kaluli, the junior middleweight champion. And after that, later in the year, a big one against a dangerous opponent. Either Hearns, the WBA champion, Cuevas, the former WBA champion, or our color man tonight, Marvin Hagler. What can I say? Leonard delivered, put on a great show. You saw everything in this fight. And then coming back with the right hand. Leonard going to a window. Leonard with a right hand, and another this man and has made a no contest, spins him around, hits him with a right hand, he's now of Larry Bonds, right above us once more, a right hand and another right, a left hand, and Bonds goes down. This fight, 
Here's a little Muhammad Ali action by Sugar Ray Leonard, leading the crowd in cheers. Sits on the right hand, spins away, legs wobbly. Combination against. Tries to fight back. Bonds is hurt now. Doubles up in the corner. Combinations down goes Bonds. Leonard hands. Up. Followed up with an amazing finish to stop Bonds in the tenth round. Coming up on 15 seconds in the round, Leonard is trying to put his man away. Hammering Bonds. Arthur Mercanti jumps in, says, "That's it. That's it. The fight is over." Jones, early in his career, was plagued with promotional issues. And despite a 19-0 and zero record, Jones' career has not exactly skyrocketed the way you might have thought. For the most part, this career has taken place in obscurity, unmemorable fights against utterly forgettable or already forgotten opponents. Because there was a bit of a monopoly going on with boxing promotions and networks. Since Jones didn't want to sign with Bob Arum, Don King, or had a manager slash trainer with influential power like an Angelo Dundee, it was a very rocky beginning for Roy. Even though he was putting up highlight reel wins, but until the Vaca and Jorge Castro fight, the opponents he was pretty much forced to face because of his situation were on the level of criminal mismatches. You had a fight where a fighter who was medically suspended due to deterioration to the brain brought in, given a Florida license just to get brutally knocked out by Roy. Yet another fight that was unsanctioned by the Florida Commission that still somehow happened. And then you had the infamous Tony Waddles fight. Jones' opponent backs out at the last minute. A fighter by the name of Derwin Richards was supposed to be the replacement. The fight goes on, Roy wins by knockout, obviously, but guess what happens? That man was not Derwin Richards. The matchmaker sent the wrong guy, a 0-2 fighter by the name of Tony Waddles. Now I'm explaining this to you to give a clue how much of his early career's management was in a disarray, and why this fight is so high on my list here. So the the contract for the fight was $2,000, which Tony did not know about at all. He was given $700 and found out after the fight he was supposed to be paid $2,000. The promoter and matchmaker were shortly arrested and charged for grand theft for fraud. Jones, who had nothing to do with the handling of this fight, was thrown in the same pot by the Florida Athletic Commission and suspended. This is some pretty wild stuff here, and it's a really good thing HBO signed him. This is the first fight the nation got to see Roy. and he did not disappoint. The HBO crew was blown away how fast Roy was. Like about Percy Harris, and there he's down already. You have to remember that he's only had one fight this year. The first looping right hand caught him right on the temple, and down he went. Percy Harris motioning Jones to come on in, saying, "Bring it to me. I don't fear what you've got." But Harris is in serious trouble again. And Jones, aping Ray Leonard, throws his gloves in the air before trying to pound Harris back to the canvas. Especially throwing triple hooks like that with power. Roy stops Harris in the fourth round. Percy Harris gives Lamar Parks all kinds of trouble. And he's a 64. Oh, the left hook landed solidly, and now there's blood coming out of Harris's mouth. And down he goes again. The third knockdown of the bout. As round he backs up and moves away from Harris. Another right cross. Harris in trouble again. Can Harris make it out of round four? Not without going down. And Tony Orlando has seen enough. For two years, Pacquiao was getting turned away left and right from American promotions, wasting Team Pacquiao's time. Murad Muhammad was the only promoter that gave Pacquiao the shot. Though they agreed to meet up at 11 a.m., Team Manny ran really late, arriving at 8 o'clock that night. Murad got to see Manny in action and was absolutely blown away by his skills. Murad saw something big in Manny. And they gave me the opportunity to sit there and watch Manny Pacquiao. And I saw fighters falling. It was unbelievable, but I couldn't see the punch. I said, this is my kind of fighter. So I didn't want to hear anything else. I wanted Manny Pacquiao. And despite Manny's team not having the best confidence that Murad will get Manny to where he needs to be in his career stateside, they decided to sign with Murad for one year. Well, Murad, I've been here for two years and I'm disgusted. I mean, what could you do for me? I said, I pull miracles. He laughed about that. I said, you sign with me, I make your fighter rich, and I make you rich. Well, Murad did promise he can get what Manny needs. He makes miracles happen, and the timing couldn't be any more perfect. Four days later, La Momo from South Africa, his opponent fell out. I knew then it was time to move Manny Pacquiao in. So when I called the IBF, 
They said, wait a minute, you only number seven in the world. I said, yes, but if you check number two, number three, number four, number five, and number six, they're not available. So we are the lead available contender. You're right. And that's how we got the shot. So Rodney Sarah said, my God, you do pull miracles. Four days after signing, we fight for a world title. And due to all the planets and stars aligned, number seven ranked Pacquiao by default earned a title shot to fight Ledwaba after signing with Murad four days ago. Ledwaba was making his sixth defense of the IBF Super Bantamweight title. This was Manny's first fight in America. Though he took the fight on a very short notice, Manny was already in fighting shape. But despite that, and since this is pre-modern day internet, Manny was virtually unknown to the public. So he was a huge underdog against Ledwaba. You can really tell that there wasn't much care about Ledwaba's opponent because before the fight started, they HBO crew couldn't get Manny's name right. Tail of the tape for Lisanola Ledwaba against Manny Pakai of Pacquiao. I'll get it right. Pacquiao. But by round by round, they got it right. Manny blows through Lebwaba in six rounds to win the IBF title. I had never seen him. I frankly had never heard of him, but I've seen and heard of him now. And you want to see him and again. I want to see him again. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> After Nonito coming on the scene and beating undefeated Victor Chinian, which was voted as Ring Magazine Knockout and Upset of the Year to win the IBF and IBO flyweight titles, Nonito was on a roll. Great show after great show. Donaire's time at Showtime had ran out. Left hook, right hand. Oh! A beautiful left uppercut and it's... And he was signed by HBO in late 2010. His first time will be against unified champion Fernando Montiel. Montiel was ranked number one by Ring Magazine. This was Nonito's second fight at Bantamweight, and he was respectfully ranked at number five. A lot of hype behind Donaire to deliver with a great performance, and he sure did from the opening bell. And at the one minute mark of the second round, Donaire puts all of America once again on notice, flattening Montiel to win the title. Good oh, hey, What's he got to do to conquer America, to capture the hearts? I mean, he's got to win, hasn't he, this one? He basically has to do one thing, win, and probably win big. Does this really need an explanation here? This is pretty much the featherweight version of Hagler versus Hearns. Besides the absolutely stupid amount of hype coming into this fight, the Prince delivered and then some, to where HBO signed this man immediately to a six-fight, $12 million contract. And by the Prince, Ooh. and a hard left, and Kelly's down for the third time. He's got a half a minute and he is definitely hurt He's and the for real. fight is over. He's for real. But according to the Guardian article from 2001, it was rumored to have been a 50 million euro contract. I'm siding with the Guardian's article here because in 1999, Mayweather had a contract dispute with HBO and Debella with his seven fight $12.5 million deal, quoted saying it was a slave contract. But anyways, this fight takes the cake for this installment as one of the best HBO debuts for a fighter. And on top of that, this is the best HBO boxing debuts. For more videos like these, be sure to like, share if you're new subscribe subscribe to the patreon for patron back projects and early access i'm alfis honcho and i'm out